Hello! This video is part of a series of videos on the baseline real business cycle model and its implementation in Dynair. In this particular video I will cover three things. First, I will very briefly go through the theory behind the baseline RBC model with leisure. Second, I will derive the optimality conditions using pen and paper. And third, I will show you how to write down the model equations into a Dynair mode file. And also I will give you some uh, tips on exploiting Dynair's pre-processing capabilities to do so. There are timestamps in the description of the video below, so please feel free to skip ahead. If you find this video useful or if you spot any mistakes, please let me know in the comment section below. Also check out uh, my blog for more stuff on DSG models and Dynair. All right. Now let's go through the math behind the model. That is, uh, let's have a look at the model equations and derive the optimality conditions of the representative household and the representative firm. From a macroeconomic point of view, this model represents a perfect world. Okay, it serves basically as a benchmark for more realistic models. Uh, the markets work perfectly, there is no market power. Uh, prices and wages adjust uh, immediately. Uh, there are also no other adjustment terms or costs for installing new capital or investments. Uh, and also there's no need for financial uh, tra transactions or tra transmissions here. And also, the, uh, and lastly, there's also just one country, so no uh, open uh, macroeconomic uh, issues here. So in a sense, we have only, well, we can focus on two agents, one representative household and one representative firm. Um, the representative household is, this is an artificial construction. So let's think about this uh, in terms of the average behavior of the household sector. So the household owns the uh, capital stock and decides whether or not to save. And uh, the savement is used then to add to the capital stock. So in other words, make investments. The rest that is not invested, um, that uh, is then used for consumption purposes. Um, and uh, the, the good, the consumption good, is produced by the uh, representative firm. Okay, so again, this is an artificial construction. Uh, let's think, think about this um, like the, the average behavior of the firm sector to produce some output good. And the firm needs um, uh, inputs to um, produce a good. And so the firm rents capital from the household and has to pay a rental rate for this. Uh, it also hires workers uh, from the household and pays a wage. The f as the firm is also owned by the household, any profits go back in terms of dividends to the household. And uh, as we will see, um, as there is no market power, um, there are actually no profits here as well. Then there is, uh, then there are stochastics in the model um, in terms of total factor productivity, is uh, which is driven by an exogenous process. Uh, all right, to sum up. Uh, the household wants to maximize a lifetime utility given a budget constraint, whereas the uh, representative firm wants to maximize lifetime uh, profits given a production function. Okay, let's go into the equation. Let's start with the household. Um, the representative household maximizes present as well as expected future utility uh, by choosing the paths for consumption C, investment I, labor supply L, and also indirectly capital K. ET here is the conditional expectation operator based on, inf the, on information uh, available at period T. Beta is the discount factor, so how patient is the household. Uh, then UT is the contemporaneous utility function, and I will consider two cases. Uh, first, uh, a CS utility function, and then a special case of that, the log utility function. Uh, note that uh, both utility functions here are additively separable and have two arguments. Okay, so uh, in, a sense, uh, in both, the marginal utility of consumption is positive, so the household likes to consume, but more labor, on the other hand, reduces utility, so the household actually likes not to work. Now, this, this gamma and psi are utility parameters that assign a certain weight to utility from consumption or utility from time, um, because 1 minus LT is the time the household does not work. 
So um, the normalization I use here is that uh, if you say work eight hours a day, uh, this L will be one over three. Eta C is uh, the coefficient of relative risk aversion, um, or in other, its inverse is actually the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. Eta L, or more precisely minus one over Eta L, uh, it has a role in determining the um, elasticity of uh, labor with respect to the wage. And we will see that uh, setting uh, eta c and eta l to 1 is actually equivalent to just using the log utility function as the, the marginal utilities are the same. So nothing else happens here, no preference shifters, no shocks, no um, other uh, rigidities. But there is a budget constraint, so expenditures uh, here on the left hand side must be less or equal to income and wealth. Okay, so in each period the household takes uh, the real wage as given and supplies uh, perfectly elastic labor uh, services to the firm and in return uh, she uh, gets labor income in the amount of WT times LT. Additionally, she gets revenues from renting uh, capital KT at uh, the interest uh, rate RT. To the, um, it rents this to the firm and also any profits go back to the household um, since the firm is owned by the household and profits here are denoted by capital PI. Now this, this income and wealth on the right hand side is used to, to finance consumption C and investment goods I. And actually, as utility is always increasing, we don't want to waste any resources here. So this inequality sign will actually be an equality sign when we uh, look at the optimal uh, allocations. Now let's have a look at the law of motion for capital, um, which is quite standard. Uh, we have a depreciation rate delta. So today's capital stock is equal to non-depreciated capital from yesterday. So this one minus delta times kt minus one, plus today's investment it. And here I'm using um, a very important convention for stock variables. This is very important when you when we will go ahead and use Dynair to solve the model. So Dynair requires a stock at the end of period concept, okay, and not a beginning of the period concept, which is often used in the RBC literature. So you will often find the case that uh, this equation will read kt plus 1 equals 1 minus delta kt plus it. Okay, and the idea behind Dynair's convention is that the timing of a variable reflects when this variable is decided. And the capital stock that is available today in period t is actually decided in period t minus 1 by deciding on the investment. Okay, so just keep this in mind because this will also be important when we look at the production function. Let's do that. Let's have a look at the firm sector. Um, the firms, uh, the, the representative firm produces an output good YT given a production function F, which has a Cobb Douglas shape. So they use a certain productivity level AT uh, that impacts both production inputs labor L and capital K. So this is what we call total factor productivity. Again, be careful about the timing issue here because the capital stock that is available today is denoted by kt minus one. Now let's have a look at the profits which are equal to sell output goods, yt. We normalize the price uh, to, to one, which is also in just in real terms. Uh, minus the, the costs from labor demand, this is um, WT times LT, minus the costs from renting capital at interest rate RT. And the objective of the firm is to maximize current and future expected profits um, by choosing uh, the paths for their labor demand and therefore their capital demand. Now, this uh, when we look at future future expected profits, we need to um, to look at the present value of these, and uh, we use here a stochastic discount factor, this beta raised to the power of j times q t plus j, which this, so this q reflects the idea 
that the household owns the firm. So any future additional profit uh, when looking at present values uh, needs to be evaluated in terms of relative marginal utility benefits, um, consumption benefits, okay, between, uh, between the periods. Okay, now even though um, this optimization problem has an infinite time horizon, um, this is actually a static uh, problem of ch just choosing uh, LT and KT minus one uh, without the need to look into the future dynamics of uh, today's decisions. So the problem is always a static one. Now, the, uh, there's also stoch stochastics in the model um, and we have uh, productivity, which is uh, or total factor productivity, which is the driving force of the economy and it evolves according to some process here, for instance, the a, an autoregressive process with persistence parameter rho a and uh, TFP shock epsilon uh, a. And this shock is typically drawn from some distribution and in Dynair and almost all of the literature, we usually assume that this is the normal distribution with mean zero and some standard deviation. Now to close the model, we need some additional uh, conditions and restrictions. Um, first, we impose non-negativity um, uh, constraints on uh, capital. Uh, consumption and investment, and also my, due to my normalization of labor, which is bounded uh, to zero and one. And there's also then, of course, clearing of markets. So the output good can be used either for consumption goods or investment goods. There, as, and there are no adjustment costs here. Now, do we really care about those corner solutions? Um, no, because uh, actually more consumption and more investment is always better. Um, so when we look at our utility function, we like to consume more goods. So more goods are always better. So the, the, the lower bound of zero cannot be optimal. Then on the other hand, we have the, the Cobb-Douglas uh, function for producing the good. So we need at least some work to produce at all. So L cannot be zero. Uh, on the other hand, L can also not be one because um, the household also likes leisure and not to work. So working 24 hours a day cannot be optimal as well. So those corner solutions, those non-negativity constraints, um, will never, uh, we will never get those corner solutions here. But what about capital? Um, and here we, we need to impose one more very important condition, the so-called transversality condition. Uh, and the idea here is that um, actually we, we have an infinite horizon um, dynamic optimization problem. But for now, let's assume uh, that it would actually be a finite uh, horizon uh, problem. So that the, the end of the world um, happens at period T plus S. So is it optimal to have any capital left at when the world uh, goes to end? And of course not, because if we, uh, we would waste something, okay? We could actually consume the leftover capital and this will give me more lifetime utility. And how much more exactly? Well, this is what the transversality condition um, tells you that there, there should, should be not be uh, any uh, leftover capital at the end because this would actually give me a present value, a discounted utility of beta uh, raised to the power of s times the marginal utility of consumption times the leftover capital. And uh, in an infinite time um, dynamic optimization problem, we have a similar condition. Okay, so, um, so we take basically uh, the, um, the limit here. And more generally speaking, uh, the transversality uh, condition for any or for an infinite time horizon dynamic optimization problem is a boundary condition, uh, which will then determine uh, a certain solution uh, to the problem's first order conditions, okay, together with the, with the initial state of the economy. So uh, the, the transversality condition requires the, the present value of, um, of uh, certain uh, variables, of certain state variables or uh, depth variables um, to converge to zero as the planning horizon goes to infinity, okay? And why is this useful? Well, basically, um, this enables us 
to simply focus on first order conditions uh, when we look at, at the optimal allocation. Uh, and we don't need to evaluate those uh, second order derivatives to assess whether we are actually in the maximum or in the minimum here. Okay, we have a concave optimization problem and having this transversality condition and no corner solutions, we can simply look at first order conditions. Okay, those are uh, sufficient to identify a maximum in the concave maximum uh, maximization problem. Okay, now let's derive the optimality conditions of the household. So first, let's have a look at the Lagrangian here. So we write down the expected lifetime utility first. Next, we have the budget constraint with a Lagrange multiplier lambda t plus j here. And we also have the law of motion for capital with Lagrange multiplier mu. Okay, now note that the problem here is not to choose CT, LT, IT, KT for all T all at once in a so-called open loop policy, but to choose these variables sequentially, okay, given the current information set. So at time period T, we decide uh, only on CT, on LT, on IT, on KT, given the information uh, set at period T. And uh, then in period T plus one, we go ahead and then again decide on CT plus one, CT plus uh, LT plus one, IT plus one, and KT plus one, okay? So this is what, what, I, what I would call a closed loop policy here. Okay, so let's uh, focus on, uh, or let's have a look at this Lagrangian in more detail. Let's um, expand the infinite sum here. First, have a look at when j is equals to zero. And we can see that ct, lt, kt, and it, all variables are actually in j equals zero. And some variables are also in uh, when the sum uh, is evaluated at j equals one. The words current decision has an impact on tomorrow's allocation, okay? And with j uh, um, greater than one, um, there are no uh, ct, lt, it, or kt. Okay, so we need to sp uh, specifically focus on j equals zero and j equals one, so these, um, these terms. Okay, now let's derive the first order optimality conditions um, on paper. That is, we need to take the derivative with respect to, again, consumption, uh, labor demand, I'm sorry, labor, su labor supply, investment and the capital. Okay, now let's derive the first order conditions of the, of the household. Okay, I've um, written down the Lagrangian here. This is for the j equals zero summit here. This is for the j equals one summit. And we have seen in the presentation that we do not care about the j equals two and uh, greater than two summits. Okay, now let's derive the, take the derivative with respect to consumption. So, okay, now let's see where we have consumption. We have consumption here, we have consumption there, and basically that is it. Okay, so the derivative with respect to consumption. Okay, now let's take the derivative with respect to labor choice. Okay, let's see where is labor. Labor is here and we have labor here and that is it. Okay, and this is the second equation. Okay, now let's take the derivative with respect to investment. Let's have a look. We have investment here, we have investment here, and that is it. So we see that both Lagrange multipliers are actually equal. 
And lastly, let's have a look at the derivative with respect to capital KT, KT here. We have KT here and we also have KT here. Okay, so here is where today's decision has also an impact on tomorrow's decision. Okay, now let's take the derivative with respect to kt and we can rearrange a bit to get and this is equation 4. This is equation 3. Good. Now let's rearrange. Let's put 1 and equation number 3 into 4. Okay, so this is equation 4 right here and this is equation 3 and this is 1. Okay, let's put this into 4 and we get that the marginal utility of consumption today must be equal to discounted marginal utility of tomorrow of consumption times the gross rate on invest on saving. Okay, and this is our optimality condition number one. Okay, next we plug in equation one into two. Okay. This is equation two and we plug in this guy over here into here. And we get that the real wage must be equal to minus the disutility of labor uh, over marginal utility of consumption. And this is our optimality condition number two. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, we're back. Um, now let's discuss these uh, optimality conditions in more detail. So equation number one here is the so-called Euler equation of intertemporal optimality. It reflects the trade-off between consumption and savings. And here the idea is that uh, the marginal utility here of one unit of consumption of one marginal unit of consumption uh, is equal to this UTC. But if the household uh, saves this marginal unit of consumption, she can actually consume the gr a gross rate of return on capital. That is this one minus delta plus RT plus one units in the following period. So consuming tomorrow has of course expected utility ET, uh, UT plus one C, and to actually be able to compare both terms, we need to discount the, the right-hand side, the expected marginal utility by beta. And in an optimum allocation, uh, so that is in an inner solution, the household must be indifferent between uh, both choices, between uh, consuming a marginal utility today or saving it and consuming um, the gross ret rate return um, on capital and so consuming this in the next period. And there must be indifference so we need to equate the left hand side to the right hand side. Equation number two is the intratemporal optimality condition. Um, that is the optimal choice for the labor supply. Um, and it th basically states that the real wage must be equal to the marginal rate of substitution between labor and consumption. And here we can actually also see that when we set eta c and eta l equals to 1, we get the log utility case as a special case of the more general CS function. Now, let's have a look at the firm sector and derive the optimality conditions uh, for the representative firm. Okay, let's have a, again a look at the Lagrangian here first. Uh, first, we have the uh, expected profits. Next, the production function is a 
the constraint we have to take into account. And here I'm using as Lagrange multiplier uh, MC, which of course corresponds to the shadow price uh, of an additional unit of output that is marginal costs, of course. Now again, let's have a uh, look at the infinite sum uh, for, for j equals zero and for j equals one and for j greater than one. And what we actually can see that the, the current decision on uh, labor demand LT and capital um, demand KT minus one only uh, impacts um, the sum at j equals zero. So in other words, the current decision does not have an impact on tomorrow's allocation. So we can actually simplify the whole Lagrangian and simply focus on the static optimization problem. And taking the derivative with respect to yt to lt kt minus one, rearranging those terms, we get the first order conditions. Okay, so let's do this again on paper. Okay, let's start with first with uh, the derivative with respect to um, yt. Let's have a look where this enters the Lagrangian. This is here and here. Okay, so this is one minus marginal costs t, implying that the marginal cost Lagrange multiplier is equal to one. Okay, so this is our optimality condition number three. Now let's take the derivative with respect to labor. And we can see that this enters here and here. Okay. And now let's use a trick here. And then we can see that this is actually right here, if we multiply this here, this is actually the production function. Okay, so this is equal to yt divided by lt. Okay, and the same for the capital demand. Let's have a look where this enters the equations. Right here and right here. Rewriting and same trick here, such that we can rewrite this whole equation by using the definition of the production function. Okay, and this is our equation five. And this is equation Okay, and that's it. Let's go back to the presentation. Okay, and now we're back. Let's have a look at those uh, conditions we just derived. So condition number three um, is basically uh, a reminiscence of perfect competition here in the model. Okay, the real marginal cost is equal to one. That is nominal uh, marginal cost will be equal to the price. And we just normalized the price to one here as well. Uh, equation four is the labor demand equation. So intuitively, the real wage needs to be equal to the marginal product of labor times marginal costs. And of course, due to the Cobb-Douglas production function, uh, this will be a, a constant proportion, one minus alpha, of the ratio of total output to labor. A very similar um, equation five, which is the capital demand equation. And here the real interest rate must uh, be equal to the marginal product of capital. And again, we have Cobb Douglas production function. So we can rewrite this as a constant proportion alpha of the ratio of output to capital. Now let's summarize the nonlinear model equations. Okay, we have uh, the Euler equation, we have the labor supply equation, number two, we have the capital accumulation equation, number three, we have markets clearing, number four, we have the production function, number five, we have um, the expression for marginal costs, number six, 
we have uh, the labor de demand equation number seven, we have the capital demand equation number eight, and we have the law of motion for uh, total factor productivity number nine. So we, ha we have nine model equations for uh, nine model variables. So this is important to have the same number here. Um, and there's one exogenous variable, one uh, macroeconomic shock, one TFP shock, epsilon TA. Okay, now let's have a look on writing down the model equations in mode file for Dynair. Uh, a quick disclaimer here, we, do, we won't do any computations in this video, but just have a look on some uh, things you might want to consider when entering your model equations uh, into a mode file for Dynair. Um, I will cover those computations, calibration, uh, simulations, uh, estim and estimation um, in other videos. So first, um, let's open up the preferences just to make sure that we are, um, we have the mode file extension here as well. So um, the script file looks a bit prettier. Okay, now let's create a new folder here um, and open up a new file. Okay, so new script and let's directly save it very importantly with extension mod. Okay, and uh, please be careful, don't use uh, spaces in your um, file name and also don't save it on a network drive, but really on your hard drive, because this creates all sorts of issues here. Okay, so let's call this RBC. Uh, you can use upper or lower case, doesn't matter, nonlinear. Okay, now let's declare the endogenous variables, okay? So these variables are our endogenous variables, these are our exogenous variables, and we have a bunch of parameters in the model. Okay, let's do that with a var block. Okay, and this block ends with a semicolon. And here um, you can use um, Daenerys case sensitive again, so I like to use lowercase letters for variables. Also be careful of uh, built-in MATLAB functions like, for instance, the uh, imaginary I. So don't use this, for instance, for investment, but I will use IV for an investment. Okay, so this reads, there we go. Now you can separate those variables with spaces or commas or write them down in new lines. Um, the preprocessor can handle all of this. Let's do the same for exogenous variables. This is a, um, a var exo block, and also this ends with a semicolon. And here I only have one shock. Okay, now let's declare parameters. This is a parameters block, also ends with a semicolon. Okay, and as you can see for parameters, I'm using uppercase. Um, if, you use, if you do use lowercase letters, uh, be careful of built-in function. So, of course, beta is a built-in MATLAB function. So, in that sense, you could also use, uh, well, what you usually find is people use bet or beta or something like alf here or del here. So, so they make uh, mistakes on purpose to not get confused with built-in MATLAB functionalities. For me, I'm simply using uppercase letters for parameters but lowercase letters for all stuff regarding um, variables. Now let's give those parameters some values here. And note that this is not a block. It does not uh, start with a, some keyword like var or varx or parameters and does not end with a semi semicolon. Okay, so this is not a block that is evaluated by the preprocessor but this is actual MATLAB code here. So in a sense, in the mode file, we basically have uh, more or less three elements. Uh, for, for instance, we have blocks that start with some keyword and then end with a semicolon. 
And the preprocessor here of Dynair is written in C++, so you might uh, be familiar with the syntax here. Other code that is not in blocks is normal MATLAB code. Yeah, so you could uh, simply define variables here. You could do computations with these variables. Um, so call this x, for instance. Uh, you could display, I don't know, endo names. We will see that those are the names of your endogenous variables when Dynair uh, does the preprocessing. So you could do all st uh, sorts of things here with MATLAB code. Um, and the third part is, of course, uh, comments. And you can do comments like either using the percentage symbol. Um, so let's call this parameter calibration here. Um, or you could also do um, with uh, double slashes. I like to use uh, semicolons because then I get this green um, font here, this green color. Okay, now let's go ahead and write down the model equations into a model block. And this block starts with model, semicolon, end. Okay, and here we simply enter the model equations as we see them on paper. So for instance, the um, Euler equation reads uc equals beta times uh, uc plus one uh, times one minus delta plus r plus one. And you have to end model equations with a semicolon, okay? So you could actually go ahead and also do something like this. You could start, you can write, uh, that, that would be also possible. Okay, so I like to keep keep it tidy though. Let's do this. A model equation is ended by a semicolon. As you can see, uh, t plus one variables need to be indicated with uh, a plus one. Uh, so similarly, if you have t minus one or t minus two variables, you will then need to write down minus one or minus two. For t variables, we don't have to say anything. We could indicate this with a zero but usually we don't do this. Okay, now let's write down all other model equations as well. Good, and I have used comments to indicate uh, the name of the equation for better uh, overview, of course. All right, now that's it for now. Uh, let's run Dynair to see what happens. Okay, so first of all, um, I haven't added Dynair to the path of MATLAB. So when I run Dynair, RBC nonlinear, uh, it doesn't know the, fun the function. Uh, I do not uh, add the path of Dynair by default, but I, uh, what I like to do is to manually indicate which version of Dynair I want to use. And so if I'm using MATLAB for other computations, um, those functions of Dynair will not inter interfere with the um, MATLAB uh, functions, uh, or maybe of other toolboxes I'm using. Okay, so uh, this is very important to just add the path to the MATLAB folder. And we will get a bunch of errors. Okay, that's good. So uh, we see Okay, this is calling, ah, unknown symbol. Of course, right? We have unknown variables. We have not declared uh, the marginal utility of consumption or the marginal utility of um, labor, or this utility of labor as variables. So let's do this, quick save and run again. Oh, there are other unknown symbols. Oh, of course, the marginal products here. Okay, save. But now we have only nine equations for 13 endogenous variables. Okay, so we need to have as many variables as we have equations. Of course, we, we are missing the actual equations for the marginal utilities and the marginal products. So let's add these to our model equations here as well. 
Okay, now I've added four equations here for the marginal utilities and the marginal products. Let's see. Now, no errors. Okay, so this is good. Um, the preprocessor of Dynair um, was able to, to use this mode file to transform everything into Dynair's model framework. Now, let's see what happened in our workspace and in our folder structure here. Okay, so first, let's have a look at the workspace. We can see that there are several variables that have been created. Of course, my parameters, as this is just MATLAB code, is now in the workspace, but there are other um, global structures with an underscore, and those are created by Dynair uh, by default. So we have the M structure. If you have a look at the M structure, just a quick glance here, um, this is this has information that relates to your model. Okay, like model size, names of variables and parameters, uh, timings, and uh, many other things we, we need for the different toolboxes regarding the model. Then there is the options structure, which uh, contains um, default values for the different toolboxes of Dynair. Uh, there are many options, uh, so if you need to change some tolerance levels, for instance, you would probably want to look into the options structure. And then there is the OO structure. Um, that is uh, the structure where we store results from, um, from solving the model, from simulating the model, from estimating the model, or from doing other analysis within the model. So basically this is actually uh, empty here, uh, or almost empty, nothing in there. And then there are structures relating to if you do estimation either with maximum likelihood or with uh, Bayesian MCMC or with uh, GMM or SMM. There are some structures here that are used for estimation that, that store information regarding uh, prior distributions, for instance, or the data set, um, or which parameters you want to actually estimate and uh, some other estimation info. Okay, so these are the structures, um, the most important ones. And these are all stored in the, the mat file here as well, okay? So you can, you can actually see that um, um, those are the structures that an air stores when you, when you run your mode file. Okay, now what, what other um, um, files are created? This ASV is just uh, MATLAB saving temporary files. The log file. The log file actually contains your what you see in the console. Okay, so there was nothing much happening here. But uh, if you're running uh, simulations and stuff like that, you can uh, you don't have to rerun um, your mode file, but simply have a look uh, in the log file for the last run. And then there are uh, the mod file. Of course, saves the, the those global structures. Um, which is useful if you do like, for instance, uh, estimation, which takes several days or weeks, and then you want to reload those results and do further analysis with that. So you simply then load the mat, mat file and you can go. Now there are two folders here. One is a folder with the uh, name of your mode file. And here we store um, usually figures and extra files, um, uh, depending on the toolbox you're using. And then there is a folder with a plus, okay? So this is actually files created by the preprocessor. The preprocessor basically converts your, your mode file into a M file, which is then used by, by uh, or into several M files, which can then be used in MATLAB. So there's a driver um, file, which can, you can simply run and it will do the exact same um, analysis when, as if you would do Dynair and the name of your mode file. The difference is if you just run the driver file um, and change something actually in your model, those will not be um, um, captured, okay? So then you, the, the preprocessor is not called again. Okay, so, so this is basically how the, the preprocessor sets up all those global structures and whatever you do uh, in the computations is then coming up here. Okay, so the model um, you declare might be a little uh, different from what is used uh, under the hood or internally uh, in Dynair, as Dynair does some transformations to it. So in Dynair, we have a general model framework with only one lead and one lag uh, of variables. So if you have 
uh, for instance, minus two or plus two variables, then Dynair will create additional equations and additional auxiliary variables for those equations. But you don't have to worry about this. This is all done by Dynair's preprocessor. Um, the dynamic files here, those are basically um, created by the preprocessor. This is more or less machine readable code uh, of the derivatives of the model equations with respect to the dynamic variables. So for instance, take the Euler equation. Um, okay, so we, we put everything on the left hand side and then take the derivatives with respect to ct minus one to ct to ct plus one to yt minus one yt yt plus one. Uh, etc. to all dynamic variables um, and it uses um, quite elegant ways to express this in, in just a few files and to focus on non-zero terms. Um, the static files here they do the same but for uh, the um, static model that is when we actually drop all the time subscripts so for instance the Euler equation we would take uh, drop all time subscripts and then simply take the derivative with respect to just c, not ct minus one, ct or ct plunge, or just c. This, uh, this, is the, this is the static model. So this is useful for evaluating the steady state for checking whether you computed actually the steady state correctly. Now g1 are the first derivatives, g2 are the second, and g3 are the third derivatives, and sometimes we need even more, but um, not in this case. Uh, usually you will never need to have a look in this plus folder uh, unless you're developing your own toolboxes and need to need these um, these files and these uh, derivatives. Okay, now um, if you run into in, into errors in your computations, uh, it's always good to have a look at uh, what are the actual model equations you put in your mode file and compare them to what you have on paper. And for this there are uh, several latex features in Dynair that will uh, give you very useful, at, at least uh, that's, that's I think, uh, tech files. So for instance, let's go into our mode file and have a look at um, write latex definitions, write latex parameter table, write latex original model, write latex dynamic model and write latex static model. And then there is one command which collects all latex files, collect latex files, and if you um, do want to compile this also um, at runtime you can use for instance pdf latex um, so most of the times you don't need this, this you could just do pdf latex um, m underscore f name and the file will be tech, tech binder. This would, uh, let's have a look. You will see that this is the file created by Dynair. Okay, we get a warning um, that something did not compile. Okay, so for me um, for some instance, I have to provide the exact uh, path to PDF later. Anyway, so what you can see now is that we have in our RVC folder now a latex subfolder, and here you can actually see uh, tech files, okay? So, all right, with equations, for instance. Okay, so those are the tech files, and you have a tech binder when running collect latex files. This will give you uh, a binder that collects all other tech files here. Okay, now let's have a look at the PDF here and you can see those are basically the model equations as you have um, put them in your mode file. And well, this is a LaTeX file, then you have a table with de declared variables, declared exogenous variables and declared parameters, okay, and also a table with parameter values. So this is very useful if you're writing paper to have that. Okay, so first we get the dynamic model, the original model, then the definitions, and then the static model here as well. Now this does not look pretty yet, okay? So let's go back into our um, declaration of variables and parameters. And there's a syntax to, give, to provide Dynair with the 
um, LaTeX names of the variables. Okay, so for instance, write in the, the LaTeX name into dollar signs and a curly brackets. Um, and also I like to provide the, the name of that variable into with long name, so it gets um, saved into m underscore, um, no, endo names long. Okay, so right now, this is just what I have declared before, but this will then be uh, the actual names here, which is very useful for plotting uh, results. Okay, um, let's do this for the exogenous and the parameters as values here as well. Okay, let's rerun Dynair. And let's have a look how the tech file now changes. So, okay, you can see that this is a bit prettier, right? Okay, we haven't declared uh, tech names for the utilities here uh, because I will show you something you can do in a second with that. Okay, so this looks like just the model equations I have in my presentation. Okay. Okay. Um, well, what I usually like to do is uh, to give me the definitions and parameter tables because I can then put this into papers. I'm also looking at the original model because then I can double check uh, whether the, the equations I have in my mode file are also the ones in uh, my paper. Um, I usually don't really care about the dynamic model, but the static model is actually quite interesting if you have if you're having troubles or problems to to solve the steady state uh, on pen, with using pen and paper. Um, okay. Now, uh, another thing here I want to show you is um, uh, the uh, possibility to uh, create if and uh, else and uh, statements uh, for the preprocessor. Okay, so remember we have two different model structures uh, dependent on the specification of the utility, whether it's a lock-lock utility or more general CS utility. Of course, you could simply uh, distinguish those uh, two cases uh, by setting uh, both variable uh, parameters here to one. Um, but I, will, I want you to show you another way to that is more general, that is to, to use ma uh, macro processing variables um, that will then um, switch the equations out. Okay, so let's um, at I don't know, what I like to do is to do this on top. And this, uh, these variables uh, that I want to give to the preprocessor actually start with add hashtag, okay? Add hashtag define. So again, if you're familiar with C++, this uh, will look very familiar to you. Um, and I will call this lock utility. I am creating a variable called log utility. If it is one, I want to uh, simplify the model to log utility. Okay, that is, I do not need, for instance, those two parameters if I have log utility. Okay, and then I can do add hashtag if log utility. So if that is zero, then I want to have those two parameters, if not, um, okay. And I'm ending this with a so-called end if. Okay, and the same I'll do for And now I want to distinguish um, that the marginal utility is actually different. And so I'm gonna go ahead and do the same here. At hashtag if log utility equals one, at hashtag else, at hashtag and if. So if it is one, we have the minus one as exponent. And the same 
for, let's call this a labor, and let's put this all in the same statements here, okay? So if we have CS utility, we have this guy. If we have this, we have the one here. Okay. Now, let's see. I am double check. Define lock utility is equal to one. Okay, now let's run again. Okay, now let's check our generated PDF. And there we can see, all right, it has transformed the model accordingly. And if I'm looking at no eta here as well. And if you have many of those, um, um, those variables, you can be very creative with this. You can create strings and integers and ranges, and I will have a, a whole different video on this, how to make use of the, uh, but uh, you, um, if you want to have um, the pre-processed file, there's also a nice command, it's called save, so um, dynair your model, and then you write save macro um, rb, Let's call this RBC nonlinear lock lock utility dot mod, and this will then actually create you a mode file where those substitutions are taken care of. Okay, so you can see no eta C or eta L here, and only the one in the if, if statement for lock utility. All right. Now, the last thing I want to show you is that those some or often you have um, actually auxiliary variables. And it is always good practice to reduce um, the size of your model, especially if you want to estimate it. And what you can then do, because what we're we just using those variables here, is we're actually just substituting this into the Euler equation or the marginal products into the um, into the, the demand equations for labor and capital. And maybe I want to distinguish cases where I'm using also a CS production function or uh, some other maybe non-separable um, utility function. And so I have maybe different cases I want to distinguish and but basically the Euler equation and that equation for labor demand and capital demand always is focuses on the marginal utility and marginal products. So I do want to have those general expressions here, but I want to distinguish cases maybe here and uh, for this, but these variables are just uh, auxiliary ones. And for in Dynea, we have um, uh, a whole category for auxiliary variables called model local variables. And you do this by appending a pound to this, to these equations. Okay, you first you remove them from the um, declared variables, and then you just write a pound in front. Okay, so what this then does is that it will substitute all those, uh, whenever fk, fl, uc, or ul um, um, are here in the model, it will just do text substitution, okay? Um, okay, let's rerun the model. Okay, and you will see an error message that the mo model local variable you see cannot be given a lead or a lag. All right, so let's then create another one, UCP. So this is then with C plus one. Okay, now let's see what happens. All right, and now let's have a look at the auxiliary mode file we created. Okay, so you can see that those, those are the model local variables in the lock lock utility case, and we have reduced the model size. But if we have now a look into our PDF, um, 
this does not look pretty here, okay? So if you have model local variables, you will see them here, but they are not so pretty here. Okay, for this, we have uh, a so-called model local variable block. Okay, so this will then give you the LaTeX names also for those model local variables. Okay, let's see what happens. Now this looks pretty good. Okay, so this is this would be awesome if you're then writing a paper for the appendix, so people can actually see and use these as reference for um, their mode files. I hope you found this video uh, helpful and uh, maybe insightful. Please leave your comments below. Um, in the follow-up videos, I will cover topics like computing the steady state, how to calibrate the model parameters, how to linearize or log linearize uh, the model equations by hand and should you really do that? Also how to do simulations uh, with this model in Dynair, um, how to estimate the parameters with either full information methods like maximum likelihood of Asian MCMC methods or limited information methods like GMM or SMM. Um, also, I will have a look at the different variants of this model um, and what this uh, has for implications uh, for welfare and uh, policy issues. Um, my goal of this uh, series is uh, to showcase all the neat little, little features of Dynair, all those toolboxes uh, that are available um, and that simply make life as a macroeconomist a lot easier. All right, have a good day.